to another episode of the Astrolog Live. I am Dr. Alfredo Caffinetti. I am almost Dr. Matt J. And this is our special guest, Joey Hollis, everybody. Yeah, actually, it is very almost Doctor. Because, yes, yeah. uh, very, very almost Doctor. So give me a week. And then, and then we'll, we'll have him again when uh, he's a proper Doctor. Yeah. There we go. Right. Like, welcome. So. So, let's get going. Let's get going. Before we go on to uh, questions from uh, uh, the public, uh, I would say we start by talking about the news, and then I'll make a cocktail, and then uh, you guys talk about uh, the lesser sciences. The shade! The, the shade, shade of... which is a good, good start, because we will be, we will be dishing the tea tonight, mm -hmm. uh, as you, which will become clear later. Y yes. Um, <laughs> But it looks like Alpha's has already started. So, uh, the big uh, science news uh, that can be argued is one of the biggest science news uh, of uh, the last uh, 20 years. Uh, and we can, uh, yeah, I would Arguably, say. Arguably. I would say for uh, in uh, astronomy and astrophysics, probably the biggest in the last uh, uh, 70 years uh, is the discovery, um, actually, the detection of uh, gravitational waves. Uh, so, we're all excited about gravitational waves. Yes. Yeah. Well, for most of us, as you say in the lesser sciences, please enlighten us. I was about to Doctor say... Doctor of astrophysics, what are gravitational waves? Why are they so important? Well, Why should a... I care? I Why can't I go to... on Twitter without seeing the word gravitational waves? Well, I was about to say, Matt, would you want to tell us about gravitational waves? <laughs> but I'm happy to talk. So, uh, gravitational waves are... Uh, stress and compression of space-time itself due to uh, gravity. Anything that has mass in the universe or energy produces uh, gravitational waves. Uh, the metaphor that I'm using, which is uh, like most science metaphor, is sort of there but not really. It's like uh, a boat on a on a lake. Uh, in front of the boat, you see a compression of uh, uh, the water, so it forms a little wave. And by the way, go around the uh, the boat and the wave behind. So. The same, uh, but not really, is uh, with uh, uh, mass uh, in the universe. As mass moves, creates uh, some compression uh, in the space-time. And the issue we, uh, that we have with that is that the compression is tiny. So what we uh, were able to see in the detection from September is the last 20 milliseconds of a merger between two black holes that are about 30 times the mass of the Sun. And we only saw the last 20 milliseconds. It's such a tiny, tiny uh, uh, fraction of information. And they produce here, uh, on Earth, uh, a sort of compression about the size of an atom, which is tiny. But so it's nothing we could actually feel, right? We no. It's not like you could just be like, wait for it. It's wait for it. No, it's not that you no, it's, feel. No, uh, it's... We can't even perceive, we definitely cannot see 20 milliseconds. I think our, the fast R I can see is 80 milliseconds. Um, and so you don't suddenly see uh, somebody shrinking of a little <laughs> bit of an atom. <laughs> uh, but we can measure it with laser, and that is fantastic. Uh, the fact that something is measurable beyond our senses uh, tells us uh, something incredible about the universe and about ourselves. Uh, the universe is a lot more complicated, but we, barely evolved monkeys from uh, the savanna, we can understand the universe, and it's brilliant. Somehow, yeah. Like, <laughs> at a stretch, we can understand. But at a very stretch. Well, you're the expert on brains, so... Uh, uh, that's this is it. tricky. That, that's the best way to explain it. The universe is tricky, and it's a surprise that we've all managed to get this far without killing each other. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> And that's I feel like I'm in the middle of a very difficult argument. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Uh, you, can, uh, you can inter... Uh... Interject at any point. Yes. Yeah, so, so it's at this point we should probably uh, mention and talk a bit more about Joey and what he does. So, um, where is it you're from? Where are you working? What you do? What's your thing? What's your science, Joey? Go on. Okay, well, I guess I'm a bit tricky to place. I'm somewhere between physics and chemistry, which is one of the lesser sciences. Um, I would call myself a chemical physicist, but some people call me a physical chemist. I don't know the difference, but apparently it's quite important. 
Anyway, what I do is... If you know the, if you know the difference, please tell us. I don't know. Tweet us at hashtag Astrocomic Live. Yeah, and... Uh... Yeah, I'd appreciate knowing. Someone could finally tell me. <laughs> um, yeah, so what I do, I make uh, solar panels. But I make, I'm making a new kind of solar panel where we make everything out of plastics rather than crystals like silicon. Uh, this has the possibility of meaning that we can actually print a solar panel and it will be transparent, flexible, it got all these other uh, kind of new properties that we can give to solar panel technology, which means you'll be able to put them in even more places and hopefully get to a kind of renewable energy future a bit sooner. That just yeah. sounds pretty awesome. Yeah, you see, when you talk, say like that, you're like, oh, maybe it's not lesser science if it's helping the it's world. It's quite useful, actually. Yeah, yeah. I mean, gravitational waves are great, and it does tell us a bit about you know our place in the universe, but I like to think that I'm trying to make our place in the universe a bit better. This is why we have this kind of people. They, they, they arrive and put her in our place. Yeah. Well, he it puts you in your place. I'm all sure I would say is I was already, I'm already grounded on this earth. My work is all about what's on the earth, so I don't have my head in the Well, the, the important thing about science is that we're all establishing our own sense of superiority by becoming an incredibly, an, an expert in an incredibly narrow, narrowly defined subject. Uh, I started liking you less now that you're pretty much <laughs> unraveling the psychology of why uh, we're doing he's, this. He's, he's, he's kind of right. It's he like, is. Uh, uh, <laughs> You don't uh, like uh, more people that uh, are right, so you just like them less. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, anyway uh, thank you for uh, the marvelous introduction. Um, let's start with a cocktail while we continue with a little so. bit on. Uh, uh, so, uh, an anonymous pedant uh, wanted me to point out that there is a big difference. Uh, they've been on Twitter, uh, gravitational wave and people using the word gravity waves and they're not the same. Gravity waves are oscillation um, due to gravity, uh, they are um, oscillation in density due to gravity. For example, there are tremors in the sun, uh, but, uh, or the spiral arms of a galaxy, those are gravity waves. But surprisingly, even a traffic jam can be described as a gravity wave. So anything that you have certain material coming in and certain material coming out, like in a traffic jam, there's cars that start slowing down, but the car in front is still moving, but the traffic jam at a certain point it will form, but the car, the traffic jam is an entity, but the car coming in and out. So that is an example of gravity wave, and it's not gravitational wave. Thank you, my lovely pedant. Uh, so, which one do we start, from the tea or from the mojito? Oh, I think we'll let the guests choose. What would you prefer? Not to put you on the spot or anything. Well, I have to say mojito every time. Okay, so we are going to do a jam mojito. Uh, and I think it's one of you guys' turn because it's it's going to take a while for me to do the mojitos. <laughs> yeah, and you'll also have noticed that uh, from compared to the very first few astroholics that uh, cocktail making is now <laughs> exclusively... Dr. Carpinetti's job. Because... Well, what happens to the, the in, in the first few parts, you covering me in alcohol? I like to think I added a certain flair, but uh, it was not a, my creative prowess was not appreciated. But anyway, one thing we kind of really, really have to talk about, because we kind of got slammed on it last time, is that last time we didn't talk about Star Wars. Because Star Wars came out in December, we did our January Astroholic, and we didn't talk about it. Probably because we're all so good and not talking about it because we didn't want to get into any spoilers that we just completely forgot that hang on. This is big in the nerd world, it must be discussed. But also, by now, everyone should have seen it. Come on, if we're going to spoil it for you, that's your fault. You yeah. got your act together. I'm sorry, Vader is Luke's father, Dumbledore dies. Just, just, just get on the, get on the ball. I mean, like, where have you been all this time? I still can't believe that Han Solo was killed by Snake. I mean, absolutely <laughs> shocked me. I know, it's like, you know, just too many feelings, man. Too many feelings. <laughs> Although Snake looked good, didn't he? He's hmm. like, he, 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 shaved, he, look. he shaved a few, like, definitely a few years off there. He's stuck in the curls. Oh, well. Anyway, Star Wars is great. I think we can all agree. It was awesome. You might remember we had a uh, VDA, is our little guest droid, as it were. Yeah, uh, wow. see, the, the Christmas uh, episode was uh, uh, before um, Star Wars came out, uh, and so then we couldn't, uh, we didn't know anything, it uh, could have been bad. But you already had the merchandise. Of course. 
Well, you, 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 say, you sound like you're shocked. Like, you know, that no, we no. wouldn't have all that knowledge. <laughs> but anyway, what I, I, I kind of got to like pick at one or two little things that, uh, that, that bug me. And it's not necessarily about like styles or like don't hate me, don't hate me. But it's kind of about sci-fi in general. It's like why do all alien characters? Why are they all humanoid? Like why do they all look like us but green or slightly shorter or a little bit uglier? Forty years. Forty. Yeah, I mean, uh, Star Trek has sort of an explanation. Like it's, it's even worse, uh, but uh, at least they tried. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, for me, I always like I, I really love like alien sci-fi movies. I really want to see what people come up with in terms of alien, but they almost always end up being really humanoid. So I went out onto the interwebs and I was looking for explanations of, you know, what, what do people, how do people justify the fact that all their aliens just look like different coloured humans? Hang on, are you saying, how do the producers justify it? Or how do the fan bases justify it? Oh, the fan bases have a million and one reasons. Yeah, and I exactly. Did read, I did read some of them. And uh, there is a really cool one, which I, I like, like, there are a, to a whole number of them which are just ridiculous. And honestly, some people have too much time on their hands more than uh, me. Um, but there's one called the Humanoid Panspermia Theory. And if you know anything about the theory of Panspermia, it's the whole idea that... Sorry. Good lord. Sorry. Talk about lack of production value, right? Oh dear. Anyway, so there's the, the theory of uh, Panspermia, which states that uh, life on Earth was seeded by comets arriving with the uh, organisms or the components to make, basic components to make life, uh, crashing, comets crashing into Earth. But then the humanoid panspermia theory for sci-fi is that there was a hu one humanoid race that was really super intelligent and they went out into the universe and then they found out that there's no, uh, not much other life and all primitive life was a bit too rudimentary. So they wanted to, this is a quote from another article, jazz it up a little and decided to make almost like an homage to themselves and seeded uh, other planets with humanoid Isn't that life. Uh, the part of Prometheus? Pretty much, that, that is all pretty much the plot of Prometheus, well, um, and it's also pretty much the quite weak explanation that Star, uh, Star Trek gave to try and justify yeah. why it, all its aliens would have had rubber horns. Yes, but that rubbish aside, I love the idea much more of convergent evolution, and this is something that I think is actually plausible because it's something we see here on Earth. So the idea of convergent evolution is that uh, two very different organisms, or more. Um, will ultimately end up with uh, the same characteristics, but they would have evolved by different mechanisms. So we see this already um, with things like uh, eyes and flight. You have almost every organism, like complex organism, has a type of eye, a way of like uh, sensing the world around them. But you have, for instance, insects, which have really complex, something called compound eyes, which is just like loads of little block sensors put together. Whereas we have a much different, much more different kind of eye, almost almost like a pinhole camera. And that's a kind of convergent evolution. Two um, organisms that evolved down extremely different paths, but came to the same conclusion. And so there's the, there's a blog out there, so if you check out my tweet that's just about to go out, you'll find one of the blogs that talks about this humanoid uh, convergent evolution that says, you know what, maybe there's kind of like a thing to do with being an intelligent species that means you kind of need to look a bit like we do, but that's probably just us being a bit vain. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's an anthropic principle that uh, yeah. we are not special, but convergent evolution, my favorite is dolphins and sharks. Sharks evolved 300 uh, million years ago or more uh, and uh, survived pretty much almost e every major extinction uh, uh, in the history of Earth uh, since then. And uh, dolphins uh, evolved uh, 60, no, 60, no, uh, 40 million years ago, and yet they look incredibly similar. Um, and anyway, uh, let's continue. Uh, but, but, well, that, that's kind of my rant over. Like, Loving the new Star Wars characters and everything, but kind of want to see ones that look a bit weird. I mean, mm. I loved some, love me some Jabba the Hutt because <laughs> it was just ridiculous. But um, and also, how, what, what, like, why would uh, I also wanted to know like why would the giant slug man find sexy humanoid ladies attractive and use them as kind of like slaves? Also, why would you live on a de in a desert? I, mean, I know! Slugs in deserts don't get on well. I know, slugs are just like covered in wet, moist mucus. Mm. Like, 
they were dry out. Like, have you ever just seen an earthworm kind of like shriveled and dried on your on the pavement in summer? It's not like it looked very moist. Well, yeah, it just uh, they they made him look slug like, you yeah. know, and then the connotations that come to mind. But anyway, that's my Star Wars rant over. I mean, unless you guys have anything to interject uh, about, I can more interject about Star Wars. Yeah, more about Star Wars. Oh, the well. first uh, uh, yes. website is a uh, Raspberry Jam Eater. Uh, so let's this see. looks awesome. Yeah, it looks awesome. Let's see if this. Oh, oh! oh. Did we just start drinking without cheersy? Yes. Oh. Oh. oh, I'm so sorry. Let's do that again. Cheers. 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 To so. Star Wars and inaccuracies in sci-fi. I think this is tasty. Really nice. mm. Yeah. Uh, so inaccuracy yeah. in sci-fi. <laughs> so I love sci-fi and. Uh, I absolutely love The Force Awakens, it was amazing, people that say, oh, this is the same as New Hope, you don't understand anything about cinemas and movies, because then it's the same as any epic story ever written. Uh, but, uh, let's not talk about that, let's talk about uh, the circular base, because uh, if you can get the energy on a, of a sun in a weapon, you could destroy more than one solar system. You can destroy so much more, it's... Uh, so you're saying, just to, like, on the off, you're saying they should have set their sights higher? Yeah! Than just a couple of planets? Yeah, okay. Uh, it's one of the criticism of uh, the new series Doctor Who, that every year it uh, sticks needs to be bigger, because uh, um, RT, uh, uh, RTD started with, oh, uh, the, uh, the Earth is in danger, oh, and you know, first is the future Earth in danger, oh, it's modern day Earth in danger, oh, it's... Uh, uh, it is kind of the plot for almost every action movie ever. Yeah. But this thing is, uh, if you have a series, uh, uh, you need to always big uh, the, the stake. So, um, I love the idea of Starkiller Base because in the Ascended Universe was uh, really fascinating. Uh, what uh, it felt like, it was just like, it wasn't as powerful as you think. Uh, and to be honest, I would have used uh, the Starkiller Base not to destroy every sing the planet singularly. No, you destroyed their stars and let uh, them either be destroyed by the radiation or somehow with some sci-fi magic uh, make the star disappear and uh, uh, add them just... Well, you could do a lot of harm just by stealing all of the energy from their star and then moving on. Yeah. I mean, then they have no sunlight. Yeah. And they no, like, that's if you're after, like, the cruel, long-winded approach. You, oh, know, yes. you want to make them freeze to death, basically, and I, uh, die the long time. Instead, the, uh, the Empire of the First Order are all about efficiency. <laughs> mm. um, it's at this point, <laughs> I just need to jump in quickly. We've had a tweet from Peter Coles, who is on Twitter as at Telescoper. Hey Peter, <laughs> he, he's responded to my tweet uh, ranting about why are all the aliens humanoid with a great picture and he's like, here's a possible reason, I'm going to try and show the camera this, and his reason is uh, Boris Johnson hanging from a cable, like, 14 sub I'm trying union to... <laughs> uh, You know what, the, the real explanation of that is pretty hard to believe by itself. Was he, wasn't he trying to do some kind of Mary Poppins thing and then it just went yeah, really he bad? Yeah, and he got stuck. And he was there <laughs> waving his British flags for a good 20 minutes. Uh, I think God help the civilization that sure ends what... up being created by bits of Boris Johnson DNA. Mm. Sorry, Bojo. So, uh, okay, I like that uh, Peter uh, proved that uh, there's no intelligent design possible <laughs> behind this. I mean, well, if you think just... about it, intelligent design gave us the pug, whereas, um, you know, evolution oh. gave us the wolf. I mean, they just make me feel bad. They're, they're cute, but <laughs> they're gonna die. Yeah, yeah, we should feel guilty. We cause pugs. Yeah, we cause pugs. <laughs> the hashtag that, that is the new yeah. movement. Hashtag we cause pugs 2K16. Anyway, let's go back to the circular base. And you, and you both look out for it. <laughs> so, anyway, sorry. Star Killer Base destroying the There worlds. is another uh, big, big issue with the uh, circular base is how it's charged. See, uh, but that's Star, it's brilliant because all the stuff is inside. But circular base, oh, needs to be as big as a planet, so we're gonna empty a planet and turn the planet into a machine. Yeah, they don't explain that. Is it hollow, or do they just got some like installations? Just well, they got some big ass batteries. Is, is the, yeah, is the like problem like is big batteries. You cannot big uh, batteries. you cannot dig uh, through a planet. Even if uh, uh, we can bear, we haven't reached the mantle on Earth yet, we cannot dig through the crust, uh, let alone the entire planet. 
Even if we went on the moon to dig, uh, the pressure, uh, after a while, the only way to get to the center of the moon would be to pretty much halve the moon. Uh, because the pressure is just too Which much. Which is probably a bad idea. Well, so. I mean, the deeper you go, the, more, the less solid rock gets and the more like plastic it starts to flow and move. So your hole wouldn't even stay a hole. It would gradually yeah, sink. Is, so it would almost be like trying to dig a hole in a bucket of porridge. Yes. Like, it was just kind of... Yeah. That is a fantastic explanation. And it's <laughs> porridge that has a huge pressure. And so it's, it's very, very hot. And, I mean, yeah, hot porridge is already pretty dangerous. So it's... Uh, we we that's the problem with digging a planet in the mean, middle of hot porridge. I mean, let's, be honest, let's be honest. We just we should also remind ourselves. I mean, I do think it's really interesting that we're trying to dig these holes. We're trying to get down as deep as possible mm -hmm. because it gives us a lot of information about the structure of our planet because we can actually go and get samples. But at the same time, think about what holes already exist in the mantle. Volcanoes. They're volcanoes. Yeah, we, you know, so we don't it, really want to let out what's in there, basically. Yeah, exactly. Just... It could be quite explosive sometimes. Yeah, the, the, and the, just a tad hot. You see, I mean, um, shorts won't even cut it. Uh, I was talking with uh, my good volcanologist uh, buddy, uh, and he was telling me how fucking dangerous uh, is uh, the Yellowstone. The Yellowstone is a <sighs> volcano yes. that could send uh, cool down your. A lot, uh, and we wouldn't worry about global warming uh, anymore. But also, it could uh, pretty much disseminate death uh, throughout the United States, uh, and it's pretty much due to go any moment. So I'll well, say any moment, like plus or minus a hundred thousand years. No, so we no, could no, be no. waiting no, no, no. a long plus, time. Plus or minus five hundred years. Five hundred. Uh? Yeah, that's the latest. Uh, so, that, so and I was, as a physicist, I was just like, oh, why don't we just. Uh, uh, find a way to reduce pressure. And he was like, how would you do it? I'm like, I don't know, I'm not a geologist or a volcanologist, but I I'll start by making like pressure holes. It's like... Those are volcanoes. The, <laughs> That's, again, you're making a hole to relieve pressure by making a volcano. Yes, but... The, hey, so you want to make a volcano on the volcano to stop it becoming a really bad volcano? That's that's my pre uh, my approach. Uh, and he was like, no, if you do that, you're going to have a very bad Sorted. volcano. Sorted. Please submit anyone out there who's got ideas uh, to create a volcano on a volcano to stop it becoming a volcano. Please submit your proof of concept now. Yes. Uh, um, we will be looking for ideas in the next week because you know this can happen any moment. Yes, so okay. we really should get on it. But if anything, this proves the importance of doing a proper risk assessment. You really should think <laughs> about the consequences of your actions before you start digging holes. Uh, oh, like, that is honestly the most British answer I have ever had. We've ever had to answer this question. Like, this, <laughs> risk assessment. Uh, back on the, uh, on Star Trek Base, oh, yay! Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That was for the British. There is one thing, again, that is wrong about circular base is the fact how you get the energy out of the sun and it's not the magic of sucking the sun in I can believe that I uh, it Second was button. behave I don't have the gold stars uh, so uh, uh, we need to uh, they were trying to suck the sun in and uh, it would go through the atmosphere so hot stellar plasma going through the atmosphere so, so just that would not end well. No, that would burn the entire circular base, mm -hmm. and uh, they wouldn't have. Uh, yeah, it would. So we're thinking. So we're imagining like the Hindenburg thing, disaster thing, disaster, but planet wide mm. and instantaneous, pretty yeah, much, right? Um, that's uh, what exactly what we're imagining, it. and uh, it's just. See, they should just be. Uh, they wouldn't have built a uh, like a big Death Star because it would be too obvious. Uh, I like that they scaled it up, uh, but it's just. Uh, I don't know, as a scientist, I felt uh, that they didn't think that through. So, if the, anyone in the First Order would like to give me a job, uh, I, don't, I don't share your objective, uh, but uh, I like the uniforms. <laughs> yeah, Captain and, uh, Plasma, we know you're busy, but uh, you, could, you could do with us. Yeah, like, and uh, I like uh, that... Uh, your crew. I like that you have DJ Boys in charge, so... <laughs> they are, and they're three for three on these things going wrong, so they yeah, really yeah. ought to stay, take a step back and reconsider it. Yeah, the whole like circular giant planet sized weapon thing didn't go well. well so far, there, are just, there are easier ways to kill a planet, I'm sure. I mean, Slam stuff into it. Yeah, exactly. It's not exa not that difficult. We'll, we might be able to yeah. manage it sooner. Yeah, enough. exactly. We're, uh, NASA's Leave you to catch but I think the main problem here is that we're, we're not thinking grand enough. We're not having the same delusions of grandeur as the First Order. 
You know what I mean? No, he'd be like, ah, oh, just like throw a couple of rocks at, at it, it's, it's, it's gonna kill them. Yeah, but it's not gonna make the news, right? I think it might, actually. Unless it's such a common occurrence in the, the long galaxy a long time ago, far, far away, that nobody even bothers to mention it anymore. Yeah, I think that's a, that's that's a bit of a sad. It's you know? another planet that goes hit uh, by asteroid. Must be Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Star Wars aside, what are we on to next? So, uh, I'm we... sure it's your turn, Alf, or is it? No, I think it's, uh, it's uh, Jeremy's turn to talk. Yes, uh, uh, we got a question about uh, how can we make uh, um, solar panel uh, cheap and uh, available for everyone. Ooh. Yeah, well, this is a very good question for me. Uh, so, basically, that's exactly what my research is supposed to be about. Uh, whether or we've actually achieved that goal in the pro in during my PhD, not so sure. But basically, the what silicon solar cells, which are kind of like the nice shiny ones you see on rooftops everywhere yeah. nowadays, uh, they're absolutely great. You get efficiency to about twenty percent. So twenty percent of the energy in the light that hits them gets turned into electricity. Okay. And that's actually that is actually quite good. It doesn't sound like much, but the kind of the maximum is thirty three percent. It just can't you can't really go higher than that without start, you know cheating a bit. You have to do, start doing other okay. things um, to get around that. How do compare to other energy sources? What do you mean? In, in terms, terms of efficiency. Yeah. Oh, in terms of efficiency. To be honest, well. we're all for uh, for renewable uh, resources. So. Well, let's be honest. I mean, all fossil fuels are in a, in the long term kinds of solar power because they all okay. developed all of those all those chemicals. Mm -hmm. come from plants and animals they existed yeah. millions of years ago and all of the energy that was used to create those compounds comes from photosynthesis from sunlight so all it is is just stored up solar energy from millions of years ago so and that process is incredibly inefficient photosynthesis is about one two percent efficient oh so okay. it's i mean it's the... so we're better than plants we're doing very well <laughs> so we're, we're beating plants. the plants <laughs> so in the long run yeah it's, it's more efficient um but the thing is that obviously if we want to make solar panels uh, cheaper, mm -hmm. you want to get more power out of them. Yeah. So that's the thing you need. You need more power. And at the moment, and but one of the things which uh, one of the things that has happened actually is that uh, solar panels are now about half the cost that they were five, ten years ago. And a lot of that is just due to the fact that uh, production has scaled up so much and is being heavily subsidised by countries like China, where a lot of solar panels are being made now. So that's really helped, that, and that's part of the reason why solar, solar power is kind of, you know, it's everywhere now. But in the long term, if we want to make them even better, we need to find cheaper ways of making solar panels um, full stop. Because making a silicon crystal takes a lot of effort and a lot of energy, and that makes the whole thing more expensive, and it takes longer for your solar panel to pay for itself, effectively. Okay. And that's where the new technology that I'm working on comes in. So by make, making plastic materials that can absorb sunlight and turn it into electricity, um, it's much, much easier to make a plastic and print a plastic oh, than it is then. to grow a big crystal of silicon and make sure it's pure enough and it's the right kind of silicon that you can make to use it as a solar panel. So the kind of solar panels I make, which are made out of these kind of, they call them organic materials because they're based on carbon, not organic as in they're free range and they don't have any pesticides in them. Well, I won't be using them, just so you know, because I only eat gluten-free, gluten -free, free range, organic plastics. Well, I can assure you, my plastics are definitely gluten-free. <laughs> so, I wouldn't, okay, I wouldn't recommend using them, though. But, I mean, no no I... GM too. I don't want no GM plastics. No. No, because it'll in infect my DNA and stuff. And but, disease. plastics made by genetically modified organisms could be amazing. You could engineer bacteria to produce. No, I, I, I much prefer the the, uh, the safer outlook of the conspiracy theorists, and that is just let's ban everything and do nothing because it's safer that way. No risk. The knee jerk reaction no is always the right reaction. Yeah. Yes, agreed. Knee jerk reaction is always the right reaction. I do not condone that. <laughs> neither do I. <laughs> neither do I. Anyway, so anyway, tangents organic aside. organic solar cells. They're really good for the environment. Now the way they are, the reason for that is, and the reason why they're so cheap is not just because it's easy to make plastics mm -hmm. using normal chemistry, but also because they can be printed. So we can dissolve the plastic in a solvent to make an ink, and the ink can be printed on a surface like you would print a newspaper. So we can make a large area really, really quickly at really low cost. And so that's kind of the whole idea. And so we just print layer by layer our solar panel, and 
Um, I wasn't able to bring one, sadly, but we do have some demo copies back in our, our lab, but they're not really allowed so, to leave the lab. Uh, uh, but the whole idea is they're printed on plastic themselves, and so they're semi-transparent and they're flexible, so you can roll them up when you don't need them. That's really cool. Yeah, so, so what kind of things does like your lab, envi uh, your, from your work, do you envisage printed cells being used on, uh, printed solar cells being used on first? Like, what do you think like the most uh, practical application of this so would be? The first one you'll see, and there are a couple of kind of test examples. I don't know how easy it is to get them in the, I don't know if they've actually reached the market yet, but uh, effectively, yeah, rolled up flexible solar panels for charging your mobile phone. So you could just have, you could have a, a very, very in, um, durable solar panel rolled up in your bag that, and whenever your phone runs out of power, all you have to do, as well, presuming, assuming there's some sunlight, just roll, roll that panel out. So uh, not the table. Uh, well, <laughs> well, actually, I mean, that's the thing. This technology works better in low light conditions than normal really? solar panels do. So okay. they fall off in efficiency with a traditional solar cell, like a silicon one. If, you know, as the sunlight, as you get less and less sunlight, the efficiency plummets really quickly. And that's why they're not actually cost effective in the UK yet. I mean, they still need some subsidisation, and that's something I don't want to get into about the, the fact that the subsidies have just been cut by more than 50% drives me insane. But I anyway, think it drives all of us insane, yeah. but anyway, we won't get too <laughs> too political. We'll uh, let you guys make up your own minds about the poor decisions of the uh, government. We got, the, we got a question. Anyway. Um, the question is, and I hope I recorded it properly because it went off screen very fast, from Benji, Knights of Cydonia anime, people genetically engineered to photosynthesize, is this feasible? Uh, as in like humans who are genetically engineered to be able to photosynthesize, I guess. Well, I got you over there, so that is fascinating, and like in my early days of being a baby scientist, I was just like, guys, why are we not doing it? Why are we making people green? Because we would never have to feed anyone. The bad thing about, I mean, in theory, great. Well, kind of not great, but in theory, but still, the idea of it, great. <laughs> Feed the world without actually needing food. But the bad thing is that the byproducts of photosynthesis can actually be very damaging to people and organisms that aren't plants. And also, like Joey said, it's, it's very like low efficiency. We wouldn't get an awful lot from it because we use a heck of a lot more energy but compared to our plant. I mean. Think about how much you run around all day to your job and that kind of thing, and the plant doesn't do running at all. Like, even the movement it does do, it's kind of the wind pushing it. it so yeah, it doesn't move. And if so, we wouldn't get enough energy from. But also, um, in the production of in for during photosynthesis, you do have the production of some free radicals, and these are um, elements like oxygen, uh, which easily snatch up electrons from other atoms, and it damages cells. And when you have too much of that damage, it can damage uh, in your cells, it damages DNA, it kills them, it can stop them working, causes all sorts of mutations. So, yeah, great in theory, but... We do have, I mean, we do have enzymes in our body that can get rid of those free radicals, but they're mm -hmm. not... Over time they do... Yeah, exactly, that's the thing, they can only, you, you, you can only handle so much there of is that, a... and so you don't want to have, too, you don't want to be generating too much, and the kind of energy we would need yeah. to produce through photosynthesis we would produce so quickly. many free radicals so we would we'd probably poison ourselves yeah the, so, I, so I think we should leave the job to our mitochondria because actually there is an example of that in nature there is a type of sea slug yeah. um, whose name I forget and what it does is it eats algae and then incorporates the, the chlorophyll from the algae into its skin on its back and it photosynthesizes however um, there are some of these species that feed on a slightly different uh, type of microorganism and they don't have chlorophyll so they don't incorporate it into their skin and these ones live significantly longer than the ones that incorporate chlorophyll into their skin uh, because it just it makes them die a bit They sooner. might just be a little bit less active because they don't get that extra energy. Yeah, yeah exactly. Would be, would be green? I thought that the evolution of green uh, uh, in plants, uh, it wasn't uh, the most ideal to absorb uh, um, well, it's, yeah, it's strange. So the green is quite uh, green light is one of the most uh, is the most common colours. As in terms yeah. of intensity, green is uh, there's more green light than there is red or blue. Yeah. But, um, and in chlorophyll, there are two molecules that absorb light. There's one molecule that absorbs blue light, and there's one molecule that absorbs red light. And that means that the only light that that, that's not being absorbed is a green light and that gets yeah, reflected but... off the leaf and that's the colour that you see. So I don't know why we don't, why they don't go for that one in the middle, but... Because it's, it's... more abundant almost. Yeah, exactly. There's, so there's more. Yeah, the, the, but, the there's, sun, um, yeah. but there are other limitations. I mean, there's actually a lot of infrared light out there coming from yeah. the sun. That's just the heat that you feel on your skin. 
So there's a load of energy there, but it's not very useful energy because every individual photon hasn't got very much energy in it. So when it hits that molecule and it's, it's absorbed, there's not much energy and it's not enough to drive a chemical reaction. So, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know for certain, and sadly it's the thing, I'm a, chem, I'm a chemical physicist, I'm not a, 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 a chemical biologist or a biochemist, but I, my guess would be is that the reason why it's blue and red is because those are the parts of the spectrum that have got the right amount of energy to drive a particular chemical reaction. Yeah, may, makes sense. Yeah, it makes absolute sense. Uh, yeah, there was an idea that uh, there are explained around uh, um, um, red dwarfs or giants that might have evolved uh, red grass or something. Uh, and I like the idea of the fact that... Red grass on, around... Um, around uh, on a planet, planet, on a planet with, yeah, red grass, with yeah. the red sun. Yeah. You can actually so, see that in one of the more recent Star Trek films, they go to a planet with all red plants. No, sorry, it cannot be... Uh, well, yeah, so it can't be red. It needs to be a blue star. Something yeah, exactly, a blue energetic. star, yeah. So it would reflect red. Yeah. Right. It would reflect red and absorb blue, that would make sense. But then again, I mean, oh yeah, we have a, we have a yellow star, yeah. and our plants don't absorb yellow light very well, because yeah. it's too close to green. So perhaps you know it may it may not work like that. Well, yeah, we we don't know until we find it. Uh, so boys, uh, uh, drink up, or if you're finished. Uh, well, I would down this, but it is now just jam. purely it's jam, jam. Okay. and uh, I am not I'll, going to I'll, down jam. I'll, I'll give you a toast for that. Uh, <laughs> mm. Thank you. You're very welcome. Also, I made a reference to Star Trek, so all you haters out there that came down on me like a ton of bricks because I didn't really get the Star Trek reference last time. Appreciate. I know. Yes, I know. It's like it's like recent modern Star Trek, which is not proper old school Star Trek, but still. I'm right. I'm meeting halfway. Come on. Uh, so second uh, cocktail uh, for the evening is a uh, lemon curd and Earl Grey um, syrup mixed with whiskey and lime. And uh, this, is, this, is, this is where we begin to dish the tea if we have not already. Yeah, the uh, the boys look worried, uh, and I look worried because I have no idea how it's gonna taste. But let's see. Come aside, does it look like custard or scrambled egg? Mm. Like see, I would go... Uh, mm. Yeah, I, actually, I, I would want to eat custard if I saw it though, <laughs> whereas I don't know if I'd want to do that. But we will we will <laughs> trust the uh, um, ingenuity, the culinary ingenuity of... Our astrophysicist. Of the astrophysicist. I mean... Yeah, he, he, he's, he's not good. He's... The proof is in the tasting, right? So, yeah. What was your inspiration for this cocktail? Did you uh, have, or did you, were you just like, I had some tea and I'm not going to drink the tea, so let's I was thinking, uh, what we can, uh, what can we uh, make the was a little bit more different? Usually I go with uh, ideas uh, and colors from uh, the news that happened uh, the month before. Uh, I couldn't do anything with gravitational waves, uh, unless there's like, oh, I'm shaking this. <laughs> Why is this? <laughs> but so, uh, I just thought, ooh, let's do... <laughs> that was a bit of a flop of that. Yeah, anyway. let's, uh, uh, I just thought, let's do um, something uh, that is uh, tasty. And uh, um, making syrup is uh, really, really uh, easy and really, really nice. Because you just like sugar. Yeah, uh, and syrups okay. are... Uh, uh, very uh, easy to mix. Yeah, so, so you. Uh, so, like to make yeah. uh, the syrup, you, uh, to make uh, a cocktail, you just mix uh, uh, one part of alcohol, one part of syrup, one part of uh, one part of sugar, one part of sour, and see, so, yeah, and that's how you become diabetic. Yes, uh, <laughs> and uh, hopefully this is gonna taste uh, nice. So, what do we toast to this time? Uh, to. The grass is always redder on the... The grass is always redder on the other side. Yes. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> You're like gross okay. right a Not gross. <laughs> Lemony. Yeah, well, it's... So the idea is I made the Earl Grey syrup, but I was like, yeah, but Earl Grey needs to be uh, with lemon and not milk. Uh, and, uh, and so I thought uh, I can make a syrup uh, by mixing a little bit of uh, lemon curd and uh, hence the sort of sick color. There's no other... See, yeah, okay, that is the perfect description, sick color. If you can't really tell at home, it's very beigey, which... Hey, it tastes nice, it's fruity. Um, it's fruity, it's fruity. 
Get it through teeth. Oh. <laughs> shame yourself. Shame where yourself. You start, okay, I'll shame myself. But where you go to start tonight, I am on form with all these puns, right? And I'm just getting absolutely no recognition. But Sorry. <laughs> okay, how about you, you shame me? Because I'm not going to shame myself. I was proud of that one. Shame. So I'll, uh, I'll get, uh, you'll start with uh, tr uh, three gold star next, uh, next time. Yes, thank you. Uh, I deserve that. So, um... Where are we with uh, uh, stuff to talk about? Uh, I got a bit distracted. Uh, Matthew. Me? Yes. Well, I was thinking, what would the people like to hear? And then I thought, what do a lot of people, what do a lot of people like? Oh, most people like genitals. So I was like, yeah, let, let's talk about genitals. So super interesting article recently in the news. Um, about a penis transplant, so they would, yep. hey, another article on penises. Uh, but um, yeah, so in the US, the very first penis transplant in the US, not in the world, uh, it's probably like the third one in the world, is going to soon be taken. There's only place. been a, a one successful one. There yeah, is. so there's been two previous yep. ones, one in South Africa, represent, and another one in China. However, so the one in South Africa was successful, yep. although not much was written about following up on how that's doing in terms of how the function was, because as you can imagine, it's a, it's a tricky business. But reattaching like something with that many nerve endings, it's not just like you're, you're plugging in a USB into a socket kind of thing. But um, shall we shall we discuss why why is it being done? <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway, the second one that was taking place in China, it was removed ten days later due to uh, psychological trauma. So this one that's happening in the U.S. is going to be for a war veteran who had it damaged uh, in an explosion in Afghanistan, and it's as a problem that actually affects a lot of uh, people involved in combat. Um, so it's something they doctors have worked really hard to um, try and work on and provide because it does like I say it affects quite a lot of people um, but it is always a really tricky thing and you think hang on we do transplants of like most of the stuff if we can transplant our heart where we literally have to kill somebody for a certain period of time well okay sorry I, I, I was... there is one <laughs> definition of death no no, no 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 that was absolutely correct I thought you meant uh, the donor rather than the receiver <laughs> <laughs> Yes, because that's how organ donation works, you know, if, you, yeah, if there's you, not enough people on the register... As soon as you register. saw that card, they're coming for you. Yeah. <laughs> register to donate your organs, kids. Um, <laughs> the organ reaper is coming. Anyway. Anyway, uh, sorry. So, yeah, so you think, you'd think, oh, if we can do a heart transplant, we'd literally have to kill someone, i.e. stop their heartbeat uh, by removing their heart for a certain period of time and replacing with a new one, surely we could transplant a penis, but actually it's something extremely difficult because the amount of uh, sensory nerve endings in there and the amount of blood flow to that area, it comes with extreme risk. And I know you're thinking, oh, the heart's got all the blood in it. Why is that not a huge risk? Don't ask me, I'm not a transplant surgeon. Um, all I know is that it's not really well done because also a lot of people are really funny about donating their dead penises. Could you believe it or not? Like. You're, you're dead, sorry. you wouldn't be able to use it much, but I mean, it is a dear part of many people's bodies. I don't know if they'd want to part with it. I, even I mean, there. I don't remember there being a box to tick for that. No, so. that, there wasn't, but I think maybe, I don't know, it's the British prudishness. Yeah, maybe, maybe, in there, maybe in America there is a box, yeah. Yeah, maybe just in Britain be like, oh no, no, we wouldn't dare ask them for the genitals. Like, well, to be honest. But your cornea is fine, we'll take your cornea, but uh, no, nothing south of the belt. Apparently it's quite hard to get people to give up their corneas. When they die? Yeah, they are. You know, they are. Eyes someone, yeah, someone's eyes are a big part of you know who they are, and it's quite difficult to convince uh, the person them or even their family to to do that. So you see, I would love to. Uh, there's in the Smithsonian or in the uh, American Natural uh, Museum of History in New York, uh, so either Washington or New York, they um, they have a collection of all the uh, major uh, human step in evolution, uh, um, Homo. Uh, Neanderth uh, Neanderthal, um, Australopithecus, Homo erectus. That's, that's a museum of natural history. Uh, Australopithecus. Australopithecus. Not Astroopithecus. Get your head out of the sky, literally. And uh, uh, they don't have uh, um, Homo sapiens sapiens or Homo sapiens comagnon, so us, because the two people that decided to donate, both of them had bone um, issue that they weren't aware. One had syphilis for 40 years, but uh, with no symptoms. And it's uh, and so it feels like it's a little bit cursed. So I'd love to donate. Uh, 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 I think one of them wants to donate and also do, um, donate uh, um, the remaining of his dog. 
So they had a human dog, but I think that is had um, some bone deformation. It's really interesting. I, I would love, to be honest, I'm saying that I would love to donate my body to science. Yeah, his body is ready, by the way. Like, if, you, if anyone is, like, interested, just say, if and you want it, just say it's for science. But, he, he's yeah. down. He's down for whatever. But, it was yeah. a but anyway, um, and for, on the penis side of things, back to, God, why can't, why do we always, like, have to talk about non-penises? Jeez. Um, there is actually um, the World Famous Penis Museum in Iceland, and, yes. um, which I have been to, and it is hilarious. Um, they even have a little corner with a... Uh, picture of a vagina that was donated by the vagina, vagina Museum in Rotterdam and I think every, I read that every year the penis museum will gift a penis gift to the vagina museum and so on and so forth uh, for each other's birthdays which is quite sweet actually but um, yeah yes, the one yes. specimen they don't have is a human specimen because no one really wants to so they actually approach, this is just like a fun non-science fact by the way as you can tell um, the, the, the uh, man who's in the Guinness Book, World Book of Records of having the world's largest penis, he was approached by some news uh, outlet that said, hey, why don't you donate your penis to the Penis Museum when you die? And he was like, I would be honoured. So if you go to this Penis Museum in um, Iceland, or the Museum of Phallology, uh, which is a great <laughs> name, there is, is a little, there is a little cushion on a pedestal waiting for this man's penis. Um, but anyway, in terms of the surgery, we wish this guy good luck because it, uh, yeah, it they expect it to have um, to happen in the next few weeks. like considerable functionality afterwards because, um, as you can imagine, having like any part of your body blasted away causes you a lot of difficulties. I, uh, I think it would be fascinating. Um, when they did the first hand transplant, they were uh, wondering how somebody would um, adapt psychologically. And um, I think there is... Um, uh, is so um, is such a complex uh, pro uh, problem because uh, probably th these people have been struggling for years uh, coming to terms with post-traumatic stress disorder from uh, the war and feeling like uh, they're less than uh, because they had such a huge trauma and having uh, these transplants would help them uh, to feel more um, f feel back uh, like themselves but uh, it also does uh, uh, they might not feel really themselves. So I think that I, wi um, I wish there are going to be a lot of studies, obviously anonymous, uh, because I don't want them, I want the studies in the news rather than the people, the people deserve the pri uh, mm -hmm. privacy, but I think it's, uh, it's fascinating what, as hum uh, human scientists, is a fascinating uh, uh, thing. And I like that we can help people. Science! No! Yay, science! And penises! <laughs> <laughs> if, no you're into, if you're into that sort of thing mm. if you're not that's cool too we still love you but anywho I completely forgot what we were saying now because we were on such like a one track oh yeah we had a mention from somebody uh, from James Gregory at Jam Gregory hey Jam G I'm gonna call you that now uh, hey Jam G thanks for the mention he said oh clearly I tuned into the Astro Hollywood Live at the right time smiley face <laughs> and yes you did uh, who doesn't love a bit of genital talk on a Sunday evening Yes, so uh, let's talk about astronomy again because uh, we're, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we, we've had our time. Yeah, we're, we're, we can leave. We can leave. I'm it, out. It's I, to, I'll see you next month, right? <laughs> it's back to the, uh, no, the Alfredo show. Yes, the Alfredo show. Uh, no, there's been a very interesting confirmation. Uh, we have confirmed that we have observed the first rogue planet. <laughs> Rogue planet? That sounds fun. What's a rogue planet? A rogue planet is a planet uh, that is not orbiting a star. It is going moving freely from the galaxy. So how do they find it? So they, uh, it's in a in a stellar uh, cluster, in a stellar group, uh, and they told us that at first there was a uh, a uh, really old uh, um, um, red dwarf because it's quite warm as a planet, uh, uh, but is only seven um, times the mass of Jupiter, so it's tiny. Uh, Only seven times the mass of Jupiter. Yeah, it's tiny for a star. It's a big for a planet. Oh, I, was, I thought you meant tiny for a planet. Yeah. It's like oh, seven it's... times the mass of Jupiter. So they can see as it you do. It's warm because yeah. it's glowing. Yeah, it's glowing. Right, mate, as just a, seven as times a temperature the of, of about uh, uh, one thousand degrees. So they think that it formed really close to one of the star, and since uh, it's such a close group, uh, it's only 150 light years away, and then they're really, really close to each other. It was flung out uh, due to gravitational interactions. 
Uh, sorry, I got a little bit standoff on there. But uh, they, so how do they know it's a definitely a planet and because, not a, uh, just a very cool star? Because yeah. uh, there is uh, uh, the issue is there is uh, the age to death degeneracy. God, the words are difficult tonight. <laughs> uh, of uh, red dwarfs. So uh, red dwarfs start. Uh, they're very very warm, just under the um, the temp. Uh, sorry, brown dwarf uh, start. They're very very. Uh, warm uh, just uh, around 3,500 degrees and then over time uh, they cool down mm -hmm. because uh, uh, they never uh, start their uh, nuclear fusion so it's just uh, due to pressure yeah. that they heat up and uh, to get to about a thousand uh, a thousand uh, um, degree more or less they need to uh, they take about a few billion years so they managed to calculate the age of the group uh, and it's only 20 million years old, so that cannot be a brown dwarf. It must be. Okay. Wow. And that's, that's the first cool. confirmed rogue planet, and it's amazing. And it tells you that rogue planet make a huge amount of uh, uh, of planets around in the Milky Way, and we don't know. We so don't know yet. seven it's... times the mass of Jupiter. Yeah. One thousand degrees. Yeah. I'm guessing nobody's living on it then. Probably not. No, okay. Unless it's some sort of a, a super alien race uh, that is coming. Because you know that would be quite a quite an impressive way to move from one solar system to the other. Don't bother with the spaceship thing. Move the planet. The great thing. Or just 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 hitch a ride on one that's already yeah, going in that exactly. direction. The great thing about that is you can go really fast uh, without creating too much. Uh, uh, just by uh, using the gravitational forces of um, of star system, you could speed up very. You would have acceleration a couple of generations, you could move at a good fraction of the speed of light with literally no fuel. Has anyone told uh, Richard Branston that hey, he's like totally on the wrong track for space travel? He should be looking at uh, shoving us out of orbit, right? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> but if you've seen the, uh, the spaceship 2 uh, from Virgin Galaxy, it looks so pretty. It just, it just yeah, does. If, you, if you haven't seen that, just, just get on the interwebs and have yeah, a look. Yeah, they, it makes you realise uh, uh, NASA are great. You know, they make really, really efficient spacecraft, but they lack a certain flair. Yeah, this is, to be honest, uh, for as much as I want, uh, as much of astronomy um, and uh, space uh, uh, being in uh, publicly funded, uh, having a lot of commercial going to bring a lot more safety uh, to uh, space flight uh, and a lot more flair because between uh, Spaceship 2 by Virgin and Elon Musk uh, design for uh, the astronaut uh, uh, space suit, so it's like, oh, that's the future. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly what yeah. I've been dreaming since I was 13. Yeah, nothing says cool like those designs. Like, yeah, and this thing, and it's, if anything, I just want to wear one to work. Like, <laughs> yes, pretty much. Like, if and, I can't go to space, I just want to wear a spacesuit. And uh, but that's important. Uh, um, I think that it was so you know fascinating. They weigh like twenty kilos. Um, work out while you work. Yeah, I suppose. <laughs> probably they're warm enough that you really get fancy, get swole. So, yeah. <laughs> Hashtag protein. Have we got a question? You know how mainly from me. Have they named the spaceship Unity? Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, I think the the first one was called uh, Enterprise. Yeah. What I would really I love to was. see though is when they launch this. That they use. I, I'd like like to know who the first person to go and do stuff in space instead of just bringing a particular country's flag and it's very often the U.S. flag being stuck on thing. Who's going to use the Earth flag? Because there's a lot of designs out there and there's a few that have been very popular with a lot of very. Blue backgrounds and rings. Yeah, there's no official one though. No, so do you no, think, do you think the first person to use one will basically get to claim the right to, to I, decide I which so. flag? I think it? Richard Branson, 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 Branson. Branson. <laughs> Richard Branson should just do, do like just pick an Earth flag. Be like, I like this one, and just do it because I think that'd be quite cool. He'd make a huge statement. He'd be like the first person to successfully kind of master you space see, tourism, and you'd be like, let's all just get along. He'd be like John Lennon, but kind of cooler in my opinion. And now I'm going to get hate for hate for the hate from that. So, but what's <laughs> Bring not, it, bitches. Uh, I think what's uh, going to be interesting is that NASA is planning its uh, uh, Mars mission by themselves. Uh, completely funded by the US and everything. Um, Europe hasn't got a Mars mission, but Europe has a, a very solid uh, U, um, moon mission uh, with uh, uh, Russia. Uh, China has a moon mission. 
And I believe that if we want to get to Mars, we need to start from the moon because you're building a spaceship and getting fuel would be so much easier to do from the moon than to do from Earth, also cheaper. So because it would be fantastic kind of if we get to the uh, early 2020s and pretty much every big country in the world that wants to go to Mars to start realizing yeah, we don't have the money or the convincing politically of our governments to just do it, but if we put all our money together, we can do it. So that they pretty much have to be stuck together and work together, which is pretty much what every scientist wants to do, collaborate with. And it's what we already do anyway. I yes, mean, if you've ever walked into any lab, it's one of the most international places in the world. Like. There, where I think we're one of the very few professions like um, that actually really doesn't really care like where you're from. There's not that many restrictions, yeah, uh, as much restrictions as other professions. That's what people do seem to travel a lot, don't they? they yeah. In science, you kind of you you, yeah. you, have, you have like a year long stint in one lab in one country, and then you move on. It's one of the great advantages of science because you can you have that freedom to go anywhere in the world, really. It's and this everyone is, wants to work together, and, and this is why uh, it's fantastic. Um, seeing uh, uh, the other day, um, China announced three more uh, gravitational wave detectors. Uh, um, India has announced that uh, they're going to build a uh, um, seamless Lego. Virgo, the Italian one, is going to go online, uh, up upgraded, uh, and hopefully uh, help triangulate uh, a gravitational wave event uh, in, uh, 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 in uh, September, October. And uh, uh, it's fascinating that the people at Lego, they're not saying, ooh, they're trying to steal our research. They are just saying, yeah, brilliant, more, more, like, have everyone out there. It's, it's fantastic. It's telling you that we need more science, we need more things to, to test, we need to find everything. Because when one observatory detector experiment finds something, all the others need to prove that it's actually been found. It's, science is truly the most, science and art that People think they are the opposite end, uh, they're actually the true more international and humane uh, things that we can do. And who and doesn't want more data? Exactly. More observatories, more data. Everybody loves a bit of data, the bigger the better. Am I right? <laughs> data! Yeah. Like more data! Yes. Yeah, it's all about yes. big data. It's all about, it's all about, 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 about big data. data. But, yeah. like, the <laughs> bigger the D, the better, right? Yes, I was about to say something about big D. <laughs> I mean, about the, the whole, like, yeah, going to the moon first, it makes sense. You don't want to get halfway to Mars and realise that you've made a mistake. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's be honest, there was a mission to Mars, it was unmanned, where they got, they made mistakes with their units, didn't they? You don't, yeah. you don't want to do that with people. Because um, you use metric, not imperial units, Americans. Don't worry about it. No. They used imperial units. Yeah. Yeah, so they use uh, they need to use metrics, not yeah, imperial. Yeah, you said the other way around. Uh, but the whole thing, I mean, like we we have inhabited space full time. So because of the International Space Station, we've had human beings in space all the time for years now. And you know, who's to say that in ten years' time we won't have a permanent habitation on the moon? That would be cool. Also, would be great. It's also a lot closer to go back home if you're like, oh, like we forgot the food. Like you can, it's a lot easier to get it to them instead of being like, oh wait, you forgot the food. Don't worry, we'll send a ship. Yeah. It'll be with you in six months. Yeah, in, yeah. In the in the days of Apollo, it took it took three days to get to the moon. It, the New Horizons probe, I think, reached the moon's orbit in nine hours. I mean, yeah, we can get there a lot faster than we used to, and it's a lot better than waiting six months also, if you live on Mars. We know that there's water uh, in the moon, so if we build, uh, um, if the European uh, um, uh, space uh, uh, moon habitat uh, is built uh, near the South Pole. We can have water. We can have a, a swimming pool. And the moon is so amazing that if you run fast enough, you can run on water. And I'll say the what um, other uh, reason do you need to go to the moon? But there is Seriously. also there's also another issue which like people don't talk about. It, it kind of came up after the Martian mm -hmm. came out. This is one of the problems why you shouldn't be rushing to go to Mars. So we might contaminate it. Yeah. If there's not life on the moon, Huge there can't be issue. any life on the moon, but if there is life on Mars, we don't want to contaminate it by bringing Earth organisms, Earth microbes to Mars and accidentally letting them out, but we also don't want to bring anything back from Mars that we're not, unless we're absolutely sure we know where it is. Yeah, have you seen any sci-fi movie? Yeah, it's a common trope. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so alien uh, actually one again of risk movies. assessments there's a, there's a whole <laughs> there's a whole organization dedicated to protecting planets other planets in the solar system from us 
They they make sure the. Did you program. start this? It's no, sad, I, wish I, I wish I had though. Yeah, they, weren't, they, they, weren't they the people that as soon as they found evidence of potential liquid water under the surface of Mars, they put like a complete sort of like, uh, oh, I forgot the word. Ban? Ban, it was a, it's a different kind of word. Yeah, but there's another word I was going for. But yeah, complete ban on any sort of uh, progress to sending humans to Mars before they completely rethought about contamination. Because if there was, if there is definitely water there, there's a great possibility for life, which means great possibility that we can contaminate it and maybe kill it. Yeah, just exactly. by showing up and introducing. Curiosity cannot go and examine the water uh, flowing um, rivulets uh, that are found on Mars because it's not been sterilized before it was sent there. So well, they they did. They did sterilize it as best they could, but, but there's no, yeah, there's they no should do it. They need to do so it. So the, the idea that uh, uh, they thought that um, what we could do in the approach to Mars is actually going to one of the Mars moon, either Phobos or Deimos. Mm. Uh, and that would be much easier because we don't need that much fuel to get off the surface of Mars. Uh, and also, it would still be pretty cool mm. to be on an asteroid orbiting Mars. Uh, Anything yeah. else to add? I don't know. I mean, I, I've covered Star Wars and penises. I'm, I've done my job. <laughs> my job is done. Um, okay. And yeah, so if that's all, I think it's just time to say thank you very much to everyone for watching. Thank you to producer Chris for doing the technical behind the scenes magic. Yeah, thank you for the anonymous uh, pedant uh, that uh, is there but <laughs> wants to be anonymous. Uh, mm. and, uh, thank you for all your questions. Thank you to, now I'm going to forget your name so I can go through. Thank you to James Gregory and to, who else was talking to us? I forgot. Uh, thank you to uh, Professor Peter Coles. Dr. Dave, Professor Peter Coles, uh, all, all Benji uh, Stevens and all you lovely lot. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, so we have been Dr. Alfredo Carpinetti, almost Dr. Matt J, and almost Dr. Jeremy Holtz. Very always. And if you want to tweet him, good luck for his Viva very soon. Yes. yes, next week. Thank you very much. We'll 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 see y'all on the flip side. Yep. That's Median Street. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>